This week's theme is disaster response. Uh, but right now I'd like to introduce our second speaker and that is Erica Roper. Erica Roper is our early career re researcher for the disaster response session and she is the covenant of the citizen science program Hungry Parrots. Hi. Um, yes, I, I'm, this is my very first webinar, so bear with me. Um, I'm speaking about the Hungry Parrots project, which was started in the middle of lockdown um, because what better time to start a new project than when you're stuck inside your house and everybody else is also stuck inside their house. <laughs> so firstly, who am I? Um, I am the human in the photo, not the parrot. Uh, that's a little joke to my Twitter friends there, hashtag not a parrot. Uh, so I am Erica. Um, I've been working on parrots since about 2012, mostly on crimson rosellas and red-tailed black cockatoos over in Perth. I recently moved from Perth all the way back to Canberra um, and I'm now on Ngunnawal land. Um, so I noticed a lot of people were putting their um, traditional lands in the chat. So that's where I am. I've just started a new job where I'm currently working on plants, which is perfectly fine because parrots have to eat plants a lot of the time. Um, and I get to see all manner of things when I'm out in the field at this new job. The idea for Hungry Parrots started, um, it came about uh, several years ago as an extension of some of my PhD work. So I've been working on trying to work out how and why the forest red-tailed black cockatoo, which is what's here in this picture, also known as the Karak in the local Noongar language, they have recently moved from their traditional forest habitat um, into Perth city. And you will now see them in like really built up areas in the metro area. And we've trying to, been trying to work out why they've done that, what brought them to the city, because you don't normally see threatened species like the forest red-tailed black cockatoo, um, and especially large birds uh, with highly specialised needs moving into urban areas. Normally they get pushed out. So I was looking at how they've adapted to the urban areas, um, which involved looking at what they've been eating and why they were eating those things, what kind of habitat they like to, to use in the city, and also how they communicate in the city. For the focus, purposes here we're going to we're going to focus on what they were eating and why because they are the original hungry parrot i spent over a thousand hours chasing cockatoos around following them spying on them trying to work out what they were doing and what they were eating and while they might not have been hanging out in the local cafe drinking coffee or going to woolies and picking up groceries it was food that brought them to the city or at least this is what my research seems to show. I found that they were eating all manner of different foods um, in the city. So in the forest where they would normally hang out, they mostly fed on these five species. Sorry, let's just remove the cat. Um, they mostly fed on these, these five native species, a couple of eucalypts and then a casharina. But in the city, they fed on a whole heap of new species. And every single one with a star on it, which is most of the species, is not native to Perth. So these are all introduced. So we've got things like olives, we've got liquid amber, we have other eucalypt species that are native to, um, like this is an East Coast species, lemon scented gum. Um, this is the most important one. Milia is uh, Cape lilac, also known as white cedar. I started to, to investigate further and sort of why are they feeding on all of these different foods, especially when so, some of them are so very different to what their native food would be. And so after an awful, awful lot of time um, doing data analysis and analyzing videos and staring at my computer, the answer is basically that a lot of these non-native foods, these novel foods um, can be faster to eat. So the cockies can spend more time um, on other activities. Sometimes these novel foods have more seed or in the case of other parrot species, maybe their fruits are bigger or there's more nectar or there's just more food for them. 
some of these novel foods can also be more predictable. So a lot of deciduous trees will fruit and flower at the same time every year, as opposed to a lot of our native species, especially eucalypts, can be a bit, they're not really on a 12-month cycle. They're a bit all over the place and, and unpredictable. Some of these foods can also be higher in energy or have a different nutritional value to the native foods. And also a lot of these street trees in urban areas, just they're not utilised. They're not used by other species. They're just there. So they're, they're available to the species and the animals that can realise that they learn that they're food and then take advantage of it and exploit that. After I did all that work and I'd worked out what the diet of the red-tailed black cockatoos were, it got me thinking, what about all the other parrots? So first cockatoos, then the world. I'm gonna take over the world of parrot diet. <laughs> so, and this is where Hungry Parrots Project um, was hatched. So I wanted to, to capture the, 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 the traditional and the novel diets of Australian parrots in the wild. But I'm only one person and I'm pretty restricted to one location. So how do you collect data from a huge area on a huge variety of species? Uh, that's where citizen science comes to the rescue. The Hungry Parrots Project has a few aims. Um, so, I mean, like it's, it's in its um, nestling stage. So it's only three months old. So we're still, still coming up with all the questions. But to begin with, Ideally, it would be great to end up with comprehensive diet lists for the wild parrots of their traditional and novel diets, um, foods that they eat. And we can pick up records of parrots feeding on new food. So even in the years that I was doing my PhD, when I started, the cockatoos were not eating olives. So they, they discovered the olives as a food source and started feeding on them just in the last couple of years. So it's still happening. And hopefully this project will also give us, um, help us pick up records of parrot species moving into and adapting to new areas like cities. Because a lot of, you see all this stuff happening around you, but if it's not recorded anywhere, then no one else knows about it. And then we can't use it as data and we can't then use that information to protect habitat and protect resources and, and find out what's actually important to the parrot species. And then also, it'd be just great to get people interested in their local parrots and their local plant species, because this isn't just about parrots. It's about the, the, the habitat and the resources, which is a lot of that is plants for parrots. We can find out what plant species are important for parrots. Uh, do the parrots prefer specific habitats over others? Um, why do some species adapt to new foods while others don't? And like I said, if we don't know what habitat and resources the parrots use, then we can't protect those resources or provide more of them. And when it comes to disaster response, so speaking of the bushfires, as we know, huge devastating habitat and resource loss. Um, so I was thinking, were we going to get more parrots moving into new areas like cities? And would some species adapt to this change better than others? And the glossy black cockatoos here, a classic example, um, they're highly restricted in their diet. They only feed on casuarina. They lost huge, huge swathes of habitat and food resources. And they've been showing up all over the place. So in the middle of Melbourne, where they haven't been seen for 150 years, glossy black cockatoos feeding on planted casuarina. So it just shows the importance of planted food resources. And the best time to plant a tree is 50 years ago, of course, but the second best time is now and the cockatoos and a lot of parrots need these food resources. So the best way to participate if you want is um, if you see a parrot feeding, uh, just take a picture of it. Um, doesn't need to be really good. Uh, it just needs to be able to be identified to uh, species and we can do that from pretty blurry pictures and then upload it to iNaturalist. Um, if you want some bonus points, you can take a close up picture of the plant that it's feeding on so we can identify it better. You can take a photo of the foraging residue, which is the mess that they leave on the ground. You can even take a video of the parrot feeding. So this is a whole heap of, um, this is foraging residue. So my phone is full of pictures like this. So chewed up gum nuts, chewed up casuarina, um, more gum nuts, cape lilac. So even this helps us identify what the food species is. Um, 
this is just a quick little video that I took of one cockatoo feeding on uh, Cape lilac. So this just provides more evidence that the bird was actually feeding in that tree and it wasn't just sitting there. And then if we go into iNaturalist, so in just three months, we've got um, 384, I think, observations from 34 parrot species, which given that it's only been live for about three months, I'm pretty, I think that's pretty good, good effort so far. Um, it's almost 60% of Australia's parrot species have been covered. Admittedly, some of these are only one observation, um, but that means we just need more people entering observations of parrots eating stuff. So here are some nice examples. So here we've got scaly breasted lorikeets that have been feeding on sunflower seeds uh, near Brisbane. Uh, superb parrot, which is threatened, feeding on uh, some kind of prunus spur. So one of the benefits of iNaturalist is that you don't need to know exactly what the parrot is or what it's feeding on because there's a whole community of people who can look at these photos and add more detail. So someone might look at this and go, oh, that's a something, something, and then they'll enter it and then we've got better data. Um, this is a really special observation. So this is an orange belly parrot, critically endangered. I think there's only about 100 of them, 150 left in the wild. And so we've got one observation of them feeding on this prostrate knotweed down um, at the sewage treatment plant in Melbourne. So it's very, we need more of them. <laughs> And then it's not just um, common species are good as well. So soft crested cockatoo here in Melbourne feeding on Cape lilac. And it's not just nice zoomed in fancy photos that work. So here is a dodgy phone photo of a yellow tailed black cockatoo feeding on Banksia. But this is enough detail to, to get the data to work out what it is. And here's actually one that I submitted myself of a dodgy phone photo of a black cockatoo in liquid amber. This is enough detail. So just because you don't have a fancy camera doesn't mean you can't participate. And the phone photos are good as well because they're usually geotagged. So that auto loads the data. And I'll stop there for now. Um, otherwise, I'll just go on forever. So I hope that was useful and uh, informative. And I'm always available for more questions or to talk about hungry parrots and what they eat. <laughs>